On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the first permanent outpost on the moon is revealed, a new heavy lift rocket prepares for launch, and Amazon is forced to hire SpaceX. This is the Space Race. The new year is going to be a huge one for lunar missions, with larger programs like Artemis testing and finalizing plans for crewed landings, and SpaceX's mad dash to get Starship ready for its first trip to the moon. But it's not just rockets and landers. Almost everyone is thinking about some form of habitation on the lunar surface. After all, what's the point of getting people on the moon again if we aren't trying to stay there this time? So when a November 23rd post from the French Space Services contractor Thales Alenia announced that they had just signed a partnership agreement with the Italian space agency to help develop their multi-purpose habitat, it was a good reminder that habitation modules are a growing sector of the space race as well. Like some other European member states, the Italians operate their own space agency called ASI. This agency works primarily with the European Space Agency, and most of their activities are managed through that larger organization, and each member state brings their own projects to the table when something bigger has to get done, like the Artemis missions. The ESA as a group, for instance, is providing at least three modules for the Gateway Lunar Space Station, all of which are being constructed by Thales Alenia. More on them in just a moment. And this collective of nations is important to understand because back in June of 2022, ASI and NASA signed an agreement to cooperate on a design study for a lunar surface habitat module to be used by Artemis missions. And since Italy is a member state of the ESA, they get access to their biggest contractors like Thales Alenia. Some of you might not know who this company is by name, but if you are a space fan, you definitely know their work. Thales Alenia is one of the largest industrial contractors in Europe, and they have produced several modules that are currently used on the International Space Station, including the Harmony and Tranquility modules, and that iconic cupola where we get all of those astronaut selfies. So, if you are in the market for an expert group of aerospace engineers to help you design and build a new pressurized habitation module, you would likely want Thales Alenia in your corner. And more importantly, they are who you would hire if you were ready to actually start work on your new hab. Now, as this partnership was just announced, there is obviously not much to go on in terms of technical data or even comments from the companies involved. What we do have is a design statement and a single render of what the finished project could look like. On their webpage for the announcement, Thales Alenia says that this new multi-purpose habitat will be designed for life support activities, for short to medium duration stays, and for protecting against the buildup of that dangerous moon dust called regolith, and of course the extreme temperatures. Those things are a given for sure, but the announcement also claims that the design will be comfortable and multifunctional, as the name would suggest, implying that these HABs could be used as laboratories like multi-purpose modules on a space station could. It also implies that there will have to be some innovative new tech to insulate these HABs, as the low temperatures at the lunar south pole are cold even by the moon standards, getting as low as negative 246 degrees Celsius. Alright, so that's the goal for the function, but the render gives us further clues. It shows a very simple cylindrical module with splayed legs and both a fixed and deployable solar collection device. It looks very much like another module for the ISS, which makes sense considering it's what the Thales Alenia team would know how to make, and that helps us with the timeline a bit. Thales makes the claim that the MPH aims to be the first permanent outpost on the moon, and honestly, with a design that looks this simple, it probably will be. We've done our own videos on the subject of habitation on the moon before this, but suffice to say that most companies and agencies that are looking into habitation solutions for the moon are thinking of wildly new and untested technology. No one has tried to build things on the moon before, much less tried to design robots to lay concrete in one-sixth the gravity or make a hab that expands like a balloon. Making a hab like the one shown in the Thales renders is relatively easy. Sure, the new thermal shielding would have to be very cutting-edge stuff, but compared to those newer HAB methods, this render would suggest nothing worse than putting a large lander on the surface. It even looks like it would fit well onto almost any rocket with lunar orbit capabilities. So, without getting more details, it already looks like the sort of thing we'd expect from the first permanent outpost on the moon. 
nothing fancy, just sticking with what we know we can do safely to give us that staging post for our later experiments. Now, it's way too early to guess when something like this would be ready, but if Thales is getting involved, it's safe to say we're probably going to at least be seeing some scaled-down pressurization tests at some point in 2024. Tis the season for rocket announcements, apparently, as the ESA joins the other big launch providers with a tentative launch date for their new Ariane 6 rocket in June of 2024. On November 23rd, the European Space Agency and its partners Ariane Group performed a long-duration hot fire of their primary Vulcan 2.1 engine. The core first-stage booster of the Ariane 6 is powered by this liquid hydrogen-burning engine, along with two solid fuel boosters. The test itself is tuned to fire for slightly longer than the booster itself would be required to, and so when the engine cut out at about 700 seconds due to an overly sensitive fuel gauge, the ESA declared the test successful. The engine burned 150 tons of fuel over more than a typical 7-minute duration, so that seems like a pretty fair test. At the very least, it was enough to get the ESA to begin scheduling an actual launch date for their new heavy lift rocket. The Europeans are in dire need of a heavy lift vehicle that they can use at their leisure. The Ariane 5 was their previous model, and it had to be retired back in July of this year after a career spanning all the way back to 1996. Those are some big shoes to fill. But it's not as easy as just setting a date. Anyone who has been following rocket prototyping these past couple of years could just point at a half a dozen examples of delayed or failed testing to show how true that is. But for Ariane 6, it seems there are only two major tests remaining. First up, another hot fire test of the first stage will be attempted on December 7th, with the intent to push the equipment to its breaking point. The brief says that the German Space Agency will be helping the ESA test how the prototype performs in degraded conditions, so an explosion is in the realm of possibility here, and they might be trying for it on purpose just to see where the limits are. The last test is a wet dress rehearsal at the ESA's launch facility in French Guiana, again to test the equipment to the breaking point in the conditions it should be actually launching under, and this one is set for December 15th. After that, it's inspections, corrections, and final touches before a solid launch date is set. These next 8 to 12 months are going to be full of new rocket launches. Every company and agency that has been developing new vehicles seems to be launching in 2024 or just before it. We've got the ULA Vulcan on December 24th, Starship's multiple upcoming test flights, Blue Origin's new Glenn, Rocket Lab's Neutron. My point is, there's a lot going on this coming year. The space race is heating up. Amazon has been having a tough time with their Kuiper Internet Satellite Constellation, and it looks like they've finally decided to just hire SpaceX to help them keep the launch pace up before their deadline in 2026. On December 1st, the retail giant announced that they had hired three flights of SpaceX Falcon 9s for use in mid-2025, which is very surprising and funny because these two companies had a bit of history. Back when NASA was handing out contracts for their upcoming lunar missions in the Artemis program, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin and Elon Musk's SpaceX were competitors. When NASA picked the Starship over New Glenn, Mr. Bezos was a little bit angry. Thus began a legal battle spanning most of 2021 and ending with a big loss for Blue Origin. And despite the fact that NASA has said that more opportunities would be available later, one of which actually picked Blue Origin's new lunar lander, the two companies have been more than a little cold with each other ever since. This goes right up to when Amazon was choosing launch providers for their Kuiper satellite program. During a meeting on March 3rd, the board allegedly wasted very little time in choosing Ariane Space the United Launch Alliance, and of course Blue Origin as their partners, excluding SpaceX and getting them sued by their own investors. Because the choice to hire 77 launches from these companies was obviously made out of spite to SpaceX, who not only runs some of the cheapest launch operations on the planet right now, but also has the only working rocket out of the three hired. That's right, Amazon's board had chosen not just these three companies, but they had chosen rockets that hadn't even flown yet. The ULA's Vulcan, Ariane Group's Ariane 6 vehicle, and Blue Origin's New Glenn, none of which had any hope of flying before late 2023, which puts them in danger of yet another issue, their time limit. Like other constellations, the Kuiper satellites have been given a license to operate from the Federal Communications Commission 
provided they can get half of their planned constellation into orbit by July 30th, 2026. That is 1,618 satellites in orbit inside the next two years, and the only reason they were able to start launching this year is because the ULA was able to launch two prototypes back in October aboard their Atlas V rocket. So if Amazon hadn't bought these extra SpaceX flights, they could risk losing their license to run Kuiper entirely, which would be deeply embarrassing if nothing else. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.